Hi, welcome to Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone. Well, a couple of days ago, I posted a new video which was highly critical of the brand new TV series, Adaption of the Mist. This is a television length series which is an adaption of the 2007 film of the same name by Frank Darabond, which was an adaption of an original short story by Stephen King. But this TV series is woefully inferior. Now, after publishing that video, I thought that it was probably only fair that I actually give you concrete reasons to prove my case, to actually to back up what I'm saying in that shorter video, that this is a terrible, terrible adaption. So in this video, I'm gonna give you 10 reasons why The Mist, 10 solid concrete reasons why The Mist is a terrible TV series. Problem number one the major plot holes that are in the Mist TV series. So they establish this universe in which this Mist overcomes the town, and when the Mist overcomes the town, they lose their electricity, but not only do they lose their electricity, but we know that they lose their ability to drive modern chip-driven vehicles. And there's one particular thing that happens in one of the episodes which sort of spells this out quite clearly. But here's the thing. After losing electricity, oh, by the way, and they also lose communications. They can't communicate with cellular devices. But after establishing that, we have an incident that takes place in the hospital in which they are able to use a tablet-driven electronic drone to fly a camera into a part of the hospital which is covered in the mist and to have a look around and see what's going on there. How are they able to do that if chip-driven devices can't be operated in this universe? How are they able to use walkie-talkies like they do in another episode if this is a problem and communications are so severely disrupted and you can't use chip-driven devices? Again, this is, to me, seems like a glaring pothole. It can't be both at the same time, can it? And I certainly didn't see any indication of how these two glaring inconsistencies could actually not be inconsistencies and could exist together in this TV series as they have created it. There's another scene, this is just some examples of many, where um, one particular character uh, claims that his father has shot and killed another character. Now he comes running out to the vehicle, sitting outside in the driveway where a group of people are sitting, and they are right there in the driveway, they would have heard the gunshot, and he says that his father has just killed this guy, but no one thinks to ask him, well, what happened to your father? How come there's only one gunshot? No one thinks to even try and go back and have a look. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. It just, it's, it's a convenient little moment that helps them move the plot along, but isn't really consistent and raises these big questions, these big sort of plot holes start arising when you do this. Another one is at the very end of the, the entire series, the, the very final moment in the final episode, when they are pushing people off a train out into the mist, and someone, uh, one of the lead characters says, you know, one of the one of the characters asks, what are they doing? Because it's not obvious what they're actually doing. And then the other lead character says, they're feeding it. In other words, they're feeding the mist. They're feeding people to the mist. Again, how would he know that? There's no real reason why he would know that. There's no real, real reason for him to think that the mist is an entity that, that eats people, so therefore would need feeding. There's no real reason for him to think that this is what they're doing, that these government agencies would, or any government agency or group would be doing this to other people. There's just no reason for him to be saying that. It's convenient for the story, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because you haven't established why this would be the way that it is. Effectively, it's a big plot hole. It's like, how does he know that piece of knowledge? There's no explanation previously in the plot as to how he would come by that information. Problem number two, and this is a big one, is that the mist is completely incoherent in this TV adaption. There's no consistency about the rules of the mist, if you like, how it operates what its principles are, what it's doing. It just keeps jumping from thing to thing to thing. Now this is something that Frank Darabont did really well in his 2007 adaption. In his 2007 adaption, the rules are pretty straightforward and simple. The mist is actually not a, a force as such. It hides things that are dangerous. So the mist is like a fog that clouds your view of the world, and in that fog there are dangerous things, and it's all the uncertainty and the fear and everything else that comes along with that. But the rules are pretty clearly established. There's creatures in the mist, and if you go out in the mist, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to get killed, so you can't hang around in the mist. But, in this TV adaption, we have 
uh, a moment where the mist causes people to bleed, but it doesn't cause other people who are right there with them to also experience the same symptom. Uh, there are creatures in the mist, uh, these little um, malevolent insects and things that will kill you. Uh, there are people who go mad in the mist. Uh, at other times, it's a malevolent force. In actual fact, at one point, we see it turn into this big black almost Nazgul type figure that sucks the living soul out of human beings. Um, there is one scene where a character is running from house to house and they run past a woman who is up in a tree, very high up in a tree, and she has been impaled on what looks like a golf club. And you ask yourself, did the mist do this? Why is she there? Because there's no way human beings have done this. How the heck did she get up this tree? Presumably the mist has done this to her, so it's some sort of murderous thing that is just brutally murdering people. At other points, we uh, discover that the mist is actually acidic on people's bodies. It's, there are several scenes where bodies are decomposing a lot quicker than they normally would. Remember, it's only been a couple of days, and the mist is consuming them. And then, of course, there is the whole issue of Alex's death. Young Alex, the football-playing stereotype trope who dies towards the very end after being wrongly accused of rape. Now... Alex's death, when you think about this, just it doesn't make any sense. So first of all, the girl is caught up in the mist, and the mist is taking a long, long time to actually end her life. And along comes Alex, he pulls her down from the mist, and for no apparent reason why, or there's no good explanation given for this, he's able to have a, a reasonably lengthy discussion with her and, and sort of to help her out. And then the mist grabs him and it begins to kill him. And no one comes to his aid, which again is sort of not quite making a lot of sense. But even given that, he dies quite quickly by the same method of death that after, I think probably for what felt like several minutes, was not actually able to claim the life of a previous victim. Yet he dies really, really quickly. So all of a sudden the mist again is transformed now into something else. It's grabbing people, forcibly holding them down and sucking the living life out of them. Why are people even able to move around in this mist? Because we are now shown, because of this big finale in Alex's death, that you can't really do that. The mist grabs you and kills you. Well, why are people able to move so freely through the mist throughout this entire series? There's no consistency here of what the mist is, and, and as a result, what the actual danger is here. Basically, this is to me is a classic uh, writer's mistake where what they've done is they've only made the mist to be a malevolent threat when they want it to be a malevolent threat. And if it's not convenient for them to have the mist as a threat, they have just done the lazy thing. They've taken the lazy option of allowing characters to move about the mist relatively freely without experiencing harm. Now, that just doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're not going to be lazy, you have to give good reasoning for how this could be, or you have to create a way in which they could do that and not be harmed. Instead, there is none of that going on. It doesn't make sense. The danger's not clear. The danger's, in fact, for large periods of this TV series, people seem to be able to move about in this mist relatively freely. So it kind of doesn't really make a lot of sense what the big danger is here. Number three, this TV series goes from zero to lawless anarchy and absolute evil mayhem like in just a matter of, of a very short period of time with no real justification. Again, it just speaks of lazy writing. It's like, okay, the mist is all about people losing the plot and doing evil things to each other. How do we get these characters to do evil things to each other? I know, let's write them doing evil things to each other really, really quickly without any real justification. You know, there's no major shortage of food. There's, I mean, that does come later, a shortage of food, but not really a sound explanation. It's really not. Um, but th there's no real motivation here that would cause these characters to go from just these ordinary everyday townsfolk in a disaster type scenario to all of a sudden, uh, you know, instituting their own forms of government and meting out their own evil punishments and everything else on each other. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. And it's not, it wouldn't, I don't think this would have been too hard to fix. Part of the problem here is that they tried to take what is a very short 
and sharp and condensed story and needs to be and then they try to drag it out over a whole series and they try to spread it out over different locations and when you do that that actually kills all of the fear which is the motivating factor which causes people to start becoming very insular and fearful and very narrow in the way that they think and act in the way that they think about ethics and all of a sudden the end starts to justify the means but there's no real motivation for that to be happening in this TV series certainly not so quickly Floor number four. The actions of the characters are totally unbelievable a lot of the time in the series. Now, I get it. Television series, it's all about a willing suspension of disbelief. You know, we don't believe that people can really do certain things that we see them do on TV shows. But what the TV show does is it sets up in the writing why a character would do a certain thing. It gives you a motivation. It explains their character. And so you need these two things, basically, in order for the drama to actually feel organic, even if it's, you know, totally out there, it's sci-fi or full-on big-budget action that no one can really do in the real physical world. You still have to create a sense that this is organic, that this makes sense. It's not just contrived for the sake of of, of needing a plot point. So what you need, generally, to make that work is you need two things. You need uh, a well-explained and well-built character which gives you the motivations and then you need some sort of motivating factor, right, to actually then cause this action or reaction in a character. Now, if you're missing one of those two things, it's really inexplainable why a character would be doing that. If they start doing something that's totally contrary to how you've established their character, even if you've given a motivating factor for that, it doesn't really quite make sense. It actually feels a lot like what someone said was, I want to see a whole lot of these types of things in this TV series. I want to see people uh, dying en masse in a mall as a big finale moment while Lou Reed sings It's a Perfect Day. That's what I want to happen. Someone make it happen. And they haven't really thought about how you would write that well into the story. They've just said, okay, let's just stick it in there somehow. A lot of these things just feel like um, convenient sort of uh, devices that have been, the ex machina, they've been stuck in there just to try and achieve a certain outcome. They're not really organically flowing out of the story. It's not a sound story. You're just experiencing a whole lot of set pieces that are there to almost like tick a whole lot of boxes. So, so for example, one of the glaring things is why is no one trying to find out more about what's going on? No one and none of the locations actually seems that interested. I mean, there's brief talk about it here or there, and they all start theorizing, but no one's actually trying to tune into a radio station or to make radio contact with the outside world or, or gather all the cell phones together and see if they've got signal. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. These characters don't seem to be motivated by things that people, even in a totally outlandish sci-fi scenario, would probably still be motivated by. And it sort of helps you when you have those things going on to give a good sort of organic flow to the character and, to, and give justification for the actions. But when all of that's missing, it just feels like you are sticking in devices because someone said, this is what I want to see out of this series. And, and they, they said that's more important than having a coherent story where the character motivations actually make sense. Point number five, going back to the mist again. The mist is not really meant to be a complex mystery. And this is something that Frank Darabond really got right. The how and the why of the mist is really quite irrelevant. It's, it's not about you know, is the mist a creature? Did it come from space? You see, the short story and Frank Darabont, they sort of allude to certain things. You know, maybe it's a dimensional portal that's opened up. Maybe it's a military experiment gone awry. But the mist itself is not really meant to be this big mystery. It's not like the smoke monster in the TV series Lost. Yet that's how they are already treating the mist in this TV series. The problem is that by doing that, you actually take away that the most important characteristic of the mist. It's not a mystery to be solved, it is a mystery to be feared. It's the uncertainty of it all that actually creates the problems, right? And that's already you can see that by the end of the series what they are moving towards is if they do ever green light season two, I'm not so sure if they will because I don't think this has actually been that popular with a lot of people. If they do green light it, we're going to end up with a series where they all go on a Scooby-Doo mystery to try and figure out what the cause of the mist is. But that's not what the mist was ever about. The story of the mist is actually about what happens to people when you confine them and they are put under fear. And what happens when hopelessness and despair 
start to actually rule the day. What happens to ethics, what happens to human dignity, what happens to our respect for each other? That is a profoundly important question. It's really why the story is so good and so important. But all of that starts to get stripped away when you turn the mist into another character. It's not really, it's meant to be this imposing, ominous force that you can't do anything about. It's not meant to be something to be studied. Problem number six, the mist, even though it's not meant to be a mystery to be solved, it's not actually meant to be irrelevant either. Yet for a lot of this series, the mist just seems irrelevant. As more than one commentator has pointed out, this is not really about the mist at all. It's actually about people's own personal issues. It's, it's, it's not about what's happening in the mist or the impact of the mist and, and the way in which it affects these people. Like, no one seems to be that worried about getting out of the mist, despite the fact that at some points they are talking about this as a possible sort of terrorist attack or a gas attack. Why is no one trying to get out of the scenario? Like, why is no one seemingly doing more to try and block up doorways and windows to prevent gas coming through, if that's what it could well be? No one actually seems to take the mist too seriously, apart from the, okay, we saw some killings at the beginning, let's lock ourselves inside a building. But then no one seems to be talking about the mist and what they should be doing to get away from it. No one seems to be formulating a plan to leave uh, the town or to, to go home and, and find loved ones or supplies or whatever. It just, yeah, there's little moments of that happen, but this would be an overarching concern. I mean, you think of it like a natural disaster. If you're in a natural disaster, what do people do? Uh, once the initial fear subsides, they then try and formulate ways to get themselves to safety. But that just doesn't really ha happen in this, and it sort of feels like the mist has become irrelevant. And when you couple that with the fact that a lot of people seem to be able to move quite freely throughout the mist without any sort of penalty or harm, it, it kind of starts to feel like the mist just isn't that big a deal after all. And there's the ominous threat that's supposed to drive the heart of the story is no longer there, and so you no longer have this really authentic interpretation of what the mist is actually all about. There are just too many characters and subplots going on in this TV adaption. What made the first uh, adaption, the, the movie adaption by Frank Darabont so successful, I think, was he very cleverly, him and the writers, and, and, and in the way he directed and, and constructed this film, it focuses really in on one main character. And it's, it's really about, it's through his eyes that this whole thing really takes place. There are other characters that start to come to bear on this story. But it's really still his story. That it's a very clear protagonist situation. It's a very clear antagonist you've got in Mrs. Carmody. You know, it's it's a real clear setup, and you know who you're supposed to be following, and, and that helps to, to guide you through the story, despite all of the weird things that are happening around you. But in this TV series, we don't really have a main character that we're following. You know, there's one character who's certainly uh, the stepdad, who certainly gets a lot of coverage, but you can't say it's really his story because they've split the thing up into multiple different locations and they start introducing, at one point it kind of feels like maybe the sheriff is meant to be the main character. It just, there's no one consistent character that we're following through the story. Now even if you wanted to use different locations, I get it, you know, you're, you're trying to create something bigger than just a two hour movie so you're going to try and put them in different locations. I think that was a bad mistake, but hey, I get it, that's the choice you made. There's ways to do that though still by following one character predominantly as they perhaps move throughout those locations. But they don't really do that and as a result you there's just too many characters and too many different subplots going on and you know what a lot of these subplots as previously mentioned they really just don't seem to have a lot to do with the mist at all. The mist is not really enhancing these subplots it's not really doing much to advance those secondary stories. Those secondary stories are sort of they just feel like dead weight a lot of the time and in fact, the way in which some of them come to fruition, it, it just it just feels like, again, like someone said, what's some stuff, some intrigue we can chuck into this? What's a bit of drama? Think of some family drama. What are the youths experiencing today as drama? How do we put that into our story? Without carefully thinking about the first and most important question, how do we craft a really good story and, and create some interesting, well-motivated characters in a world that sort of all makes sense, even though it's so extreme and bizarre? Problem number eight, and this is a real big one. None of these characters are likeable. Really not like One comes close. They're not really likeable, though. Certainly none of them are relatable. In fact, 
they just don't feel real a lot of the time. Now, again, I get it. It's a TV series. It's a sci-fi horror event. You know, it's not going to be grounded in reality. It's not a drama or a documentary. However, the characters should have a reality to them in the sense that even though they're in this extreme uh, and, and, and totally fictional and out there world that would never happen, they should still do things that ordinary every human beings, everyday human beings would do, even if they are fictional characters. But instead, these characters, effectively, they feel like cartoon characters. They don't really feel like real people. They feel very much like constructions of what a writer who's trying to achieve certain things thinks a human being should be. They're not really a, an accurate reflection of the human experience. They feel like cartoon characters who are just full of cliches and tropes that are designed to serve a whole lot of cliches and tropes that they want in their TV series. And as a result, there's just no one that you really are invested in as a viewer, and that makes it really hard to get into the show. And, and certainly by the end of it, you're like, ah. Oh, Gee, I just hope the mist gets a lot of them more. I hope someone just steps out of the mist. There's a big Scooby-Doo moment. They pull off their mask and they reveal all of the big secrets and then we can sort of go home, shut this thing down and get on with the next TV series to watch. Because it just, it just doesn't engage you. It doesn't connect you. There's no real character here that you like enough to want to be invested in. It's just there's no emotional dynamic or connection between these people that's being established. And I think that... Uh, you actually need that. What what made the Frank Darabont movie work so well is that think about that scene, how his movie crescendos at the end in that Jeep. And it is emotionally powerful and it just it's overwhelming. But think about the fact that these people, they're either strangers or they're they're just not that well known to him. And yet by the end of it, they are all bonded together in a way that's just extremely powerful. The connections have been formed and there's a, there is a humanity in this. And that's why that moment is so devastating and so impacting. But in this one, the humanity is lacking. There's no real connection to these characters. They don't feel real or relatable enough. So there's just no drama or tension in it for you. There's no investment or desire to actually see these characters succeed or do well. Problem number nine with the series is that a lot of the dialogue is just really poorly written. Good dialogue has a flow to it. And even if you're trying to achieve something, which obviously you are trying to do when you have dialogue in a TV series, you're trying to drive the action along, you're trying to drive the story along, you're trying to reveal something about a character, it's there for a purpose, right? I get it. But it has a flow to it. It has a sort of organic flow to it. But often these characters are just doing and saying things that just... They feel random, they, and a and, and big part of that, again, is it stems from the fact they don't feel like real human beings at times. They feel like cartoon characters who are just there to serve a plot purpose rather than to actually be characters you can invest yourself in and relate to. And so this, a lot of this is to do with the fact that just the dialogue is just, it doesn't feel like it flows properly. It just, it feels like people at times are talking, who are talking to each other in cliches. It, it, it's not real. It's not how people act or speak in these situations. And again, none of this is helped by the big glaring plot holes or by the big things that, that don't really make a, a lot of sense. Like, there's supposed to be an emotional moment that happens in the hospital between uh, the stepdad and his brother. And and these, you know, this is, this is one of the main characters. This should be an important emotional moment. He's trying to save his life. He gets him back out down the hospital corridor. Again, this doesn't make any sense. The rules of the mist are being violated here. How come, uh, you know, his brother can be in the mist and it's killing him, but he can survive it? He then's pushing down. He slips over in some blood, and all of a sudden the gurney, which hospital gurneys don't do this, slides along the floor and then tips over with him in it, uh, which they're not really designed to do. But anyway, it served the plot, and he happens to tip over right underneath this this whole roof full of slugs coming out of the mist. Again, we're back to the mist being creatures now, so it's gone from the mist being something that kills you to now being creatures in the mist. And these slugs, these leeches, are falling on the brother and they are starting to consume him. But here's the thing. You watch, it's, it's like viewer agony. You are watching as the brother now stands up, runs to rescue his seriously, you know, mortally wounded brother. He tries to grab him by the feet and drag him out, but it is just comical as he does some really bad acting. It's this pretend pulling. And and of course his brother's going nowhere, but in, in the real life, he would be moving the brother. He's big enough and strong enough to actually move this guy along the floor, but that's not even happening. It just sort of looks like he's pretending to pull him so he can get out of there as fast as he can. It's some really bad acting. 
And then just to top it all off, these dangerous evil slugs that are falling from the roof and consuming the brother, they're falling on the other brother who's trying to help him up. He's on his feet as well. He's got his arms exposed. But they're not sticking to him. They're not interested in him. Right? Unless they're going to reveal at some point that he's some sort of super alien or he's got some superpowers that makes him immune to all of this, this guy has basically got a whole lot of ex machina and just awfully horrible to watch convenient little plot moments where he's able to get away with things that apparently you're not supposed to be able to do in this universe. And that one was just so typical of it. And then they, he just delivers this dialogue that's just, it's so cliched and, and it, it just, they don't feel like real characters who are engaging in real human interaction. It just feels so one-dimensional. And as I said, the dialogue combined with a lot of these unbelievable moments, it just, ugh, it just really makes for a difficult series to watch at times. And last but not least, the decision to put a whole lot of the characters in the mall, I think was a bad decision. First of all, I think it was a bad decision to separate the characters into different locations. We've got the church, we've got the jail at one point, we've got the mall, we've got the hospital. I think it was a bad decision to separate them like that. What they should have done, I think, and this is where they could have used the mall, was actually put them all together in the mall and then have them in a situation where they have established a commune. Wouldn't it have been actually really, really interesting and certainly a great premise for a show if this was a mall in the next town over. So the mist has come through their town as well, but for some reason they're trapped and the mist hasn't cleared and they have been there for weeks or maybe even a couple of months. And these people have set up what they thought was just going to be a temporary shelter in the mall and it turns out it has had to become their home and then all of the problems have evolved from that fact. Now that would have been interesting. But instead what they do is they separate characters all over the town, which does not help the flow of the TV series, and it kills the whole tension and the claustrophobic fear that, that is actually supposed to be central to the story. Then they put them in a mall, but the mall doesn't really make a lot of sense as a venue for them to be if you're trying to protect yourself from the mist. And you're also trying to give motivations and reasons for why they would start turning on each other. So first of all, in that mall, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that there are lots and lots of ways the mist would get into that mall. It's not a very well-contained space. There's air conditioning vents, there's doors and windows all over the place. It's a huge building. You know, it's it's going to be impossible to keep the mist out, yet they've effectively managed to do that. That is one little area that it was convenient, again, for the plot to have the mist, you know, getting into. But then other than that, they've kept the mist out of the small and they, and they keep it out relatively successfully. Uh, the other thing too that's interesting is they haven't really created the tension that Frank Darabont got really right. In his uh, film adaption, even though you're inside and the mist hasn't come inside, you're still not safe. Remember the front store window in that grocery store and they have to pack it up and they have to, 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 to sort of arm themselves against it to try and stop things at one point flying through it? They're still in great danger. They're never safe even when they're inside. But what they've done in this mall is they've removed that tension altogether. They seem to be quite happily enjoying themselves for a lot of the time while they're in this mall. And it's got, the other thing about the mall is there's actually a lot of food in a mall. And that ruins their ability to actually try and create this drama and tension out of starvation or the threat of starvation. It's not a credible threat when you're in a mall with that small amount of people. It's just not a credible threat. Unless you're going to establish them going crazy in the first couple of days because they think they're going to be rescued, and so they eat all of the food and consume it relatively quickly, which they don't do, uh, then there is no credible threat here. What Frank Darabont was very smart in, in his film was, he realised in a grocery store that lack of food's probably not going to be an issue, so let's remove the whole food equation and make about make it about other things that are more real, more visceral, more more deadly really. You know, those real dangerous threats of, of fear and claustrophobia, not a lack of food. But in this one it just doesn't it's not believable that they would run out of food with that small amount of people. And the other thing of course is that the mall is not claustrophobic enough. The, the, again, Frank Darabont, he puts them in this small little 7 Eleven, or slightly bigger than a 7 Eleven, just a small town grocery store. And, and the whole time, you know, at one point they're huddled in different aisles, but they can see each other, they can hear each other, they're constantly looking at each other with suspicion. That all helps to add to the tension, and it gives motivations for why people lose the plot and do crazy things. You can't help but go to the toilet and stumble across someone else who's not just in the toilet, but perhaps is trying to have a private moment 
to hide away and gather their thoughts. But all of a sudden, there's so many people there and just one to it that, you know, that they can't get away and do that. And how does that affect a person and their ability to actually act human toward, towards other people? But in a mall, none of that's an issue. And in fact, at one point, one group heads off to another part and sets up their own new encampment. It just, it wasn't claustrophobic enough. The mall was a bad choice and segregating them all over town was, was just only made that problem worse. So there you go. There's 10 reasons that I think The Mist, the TV series, was just not good television. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you think there's anything that I've missed, or maybe if there's anything that I've said that you disagree with, please let me know in the comments section below. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on Left Foot Media. <laughs>